All right, so I focused on adverbial expressions in Hansu, and because I didn't know anything about the language, um, again, I didn't also quite know where to start with those, so I focused on four different categories, uh, which was dance, intensifying, subject-oriented, and temporal adverbial expressions, and these, once again, had a more particular focus on frequency, speed, and to a lesser extent, size. And my data also collect um, also consisted of approximately two hours of recordings um, elicited during four sessions. So for temporal um, adverbs, I went for the most common adverbial expressions of frequency in English, at least. Um, so I would commence with sometimes because this is much more straightforward than the others. Um, so here you have an almost literal translation combining time or day um, with one or some. So it would literally mean one or some time or one or some day. Then if we move on to habitual actions, um, so in Hanzu, the translations for always, frequently or habitually sort of blended into each other somewhat. Um, but typically the construction izano is used in order to express a habitual action and that is a, that then often translates to always as well. So for example, nizano amankara, meaning I always run, or omohuma wizano agendela, meaning the boy always walks. Um, however, interestingly, if um, it's about an Adjectival expression, no, it doesn't seem to be required. I'm not sure whether it's optional or not. But for example, if I said, sometimes I am or I feel tired, it'd just be imatu munangui nitsa nkataye, but not nitsa no nkataye. Okay, but if we actually want to stress that an action does take place invariable, so always, constructions, um, the constructions mahi kohi or contracted mahi kohi, or matungehi or matungehi um, can be added to the sentence instead. So, for example, I always sing well could also be expressed by saying oni mahikoehi nembakisa. Um, however, the phrase muimidzim um, matego once again suggests uh, another way of saying that an action takes place for, well pretty much on a regular basis. Um, so that would translate to something along the lines of you drink water, but not every time. So that, however, um, indicates that it's, again, sort of in between states. So it's frequent, but not as frequent as, for example, it often suggests. So it's a bit, a bit less frequent. Okay. Um, so almost uh, something that works quite differently. Um, as we can see. So there are multifarious ways of expressing that idea, but uh, clearly the notion of movement, uh, as you can see in um, 10 and 12, for example, so on my way or approaching, seems to be quite prevalent uh, in many cases. Um, in order to say, yeah, I almost laughed or the milk is almost white. And two of the phrases, so 10 and 11, also contain the element car, which appears to correspond to nearly, but I'm um, unsure as yet what exactly that is. Um, but I'm certain that this does mean nearly in 11, because um, in Super Amala, which they literally translate to the bottle is finished, so the bottle is empty. All right, so for never, um, it appears that having a regular negation in a sentence suffices to say, uh, to also express that something never happens. So, Shanga Wiluga would translate to he does not cook, literally, but it could also um, mean that he never cooks. So, there's not really a distinction made there. One could add Lukulu to that sentence. So, Shanga Wigenda Lukulu would be he does not, sorry, he does not walk completely. That's a mistake, I'm sorry. Um, but that would again imply, of course, something slightly different so that the action is not carried out completely. So it's almost never, once again, works differently from almost, as we've just seen, because here you always have the attenuative marker is in these sentences. So we mankisa, you almost never run, or we gendisa, you almost never walk. But if we take that last phrase, we gendisa, 
this is now without context, but in a different situation. Um, for example, when we say umhumma wigenisa, this could also mean the boy walks slowly. So is um appears to just attenuate the meaning of the verb in different ways. So literally means doing something less, less loudly, less frequently, less something. Um then however, when is is replaced by ish. So if that's just this light modification uh, from alveolar to post alveolar consonant, um, disregarding now the vowel quality, um, the action is actually intensified. So the complete opposite happens here. Um, so when we say nimankisha, that means, for example, I ran quickly, or in your knee imbesha means the bird sings loudly. So again, it's modified in different ways, very context dependent. And that last sentence, the bird sings loudly, the loudy part can again be expressed in other ways. As we can see, for example, in 19, where the expression nanguru, translating to with power is used, in order to say loudly. Or we could also say kulu lilu kulu, uh, meaning the bird sings in a big voice. But this nanguru in 19 can also um, be found in other sentences as an intensifier, uh, very. So unyu mukuru nanguru would translate to the cat is very big or powerfully big, literally. So let's move on to very. Um, and there are, yeah, the expressions for very can vary greatly and it can be expressed in quite a few different ways. Um, but depending on where exactly you emphasize lies in the sentence, it's not always necessary to use several intensifiers as one can see in this example in 23. Um, if we wanted to really underline that um, the bird always sings very loudly, then of course we could, well, probably we could add something to that sentence. But if it's just about meaning the bird always sings loudly, then just saying nangulu with power just covers that sufficiently. And again, um, if we look at adjectives, uh, the adverbial form of ubi, meaning bad, can be used. Um, for example, in wimulipu ubi, that would mean you are very tall, but literally you are badly tall, or the book is very heavy, the book is literally badly heavy. Okay, so Thai is very interesting and in that, once again, it can stand for several English expressions that are, that are far, fairly similar. So, Literally, Thai would mean um, truly because it's uh, connected to or comes from a word meaning truth. But it also conveys the notion of really or genuinely and can be used to translate the English quiet or fairly. And because of the proximity between really and very, it's also used to translate very once again. So, Imbuani no Thai, for example, would be the dog is truly small or the dog is very small. So I've already covered the first of my stance adverbs, so I'll move on to the others now. Um, I also looked at clearly. And here again, we can see the tie tie, uh, which is a sentence I'll come back to later as well. Um, so that's one way of expressing clearly, but really doesn't exactly mean that, right? So an alternative way is to add the expression ingi. Um, because that then contains the element of certainty, which obviously or clearly does in English. So in the sentence 29, that would mean the boy looks tired um, or something along these lines, because just by looking at that boy, by seeing him, I know that he's tired. So I know the boy is tired. So um, my data also included two options for expressing maybe or perhaps. Um, one, so meaning possibly, and the other one, koala, meaning perhaps. But I didn't have much more data on that, I'm afraid. Okay, so it was, um, this, is, is one of a, this is a bit of an odd one out, maybe, but I was quite interested to see how um, Hansu Speaks would treat adverbs such as hopefully. And with this one, apparently, speakers would also translate that almost literally using a verb or a verb for to hope, which then, as you can see, also has a meaning of to think or to believe. So nihoe kena okataya would mean I hope or I believe she is tired.
Right. And I also had a look at um, two further elements, the two further, further morphemes, L and UN. Um, so let's start by having a look at the verb for to walk. Um, weekenda would be he walks. Um, and if we say weekendanga, that's still he walks. Um, but if we add an L to that, so weekendangeda, that would be he walks quickly. So let's compare that verb with another one, which is hitting. So umikua would be just he hits. But now if we say umikuanga, that would mean he hits repeatedly. So that's this um, additional element in there. And again, umikuangeda would mean he hits um, yeah, powerfully, fiercely, and repeatedly. So the intensity is definitely there when we have angel in these verbs. It on its own, however, also occurs in constructions um, with itano, as we've seen in the beginning. For example, in witano anguela, you always drink or you habitually drink. Um, that was virtually always the case because there was one sentence which does not fit this pattern because it doesn't contain L. And that was umusungu witano aligitia kinkile. The woman always speaks quietly. Um, so based on that, it would seem that, bo that if both ang and l are affixed to the verb, l is a marker of intensity. But if l occurs in a different context, which was the only other one I found, so um, it's part of then it's part of the construction expressing habitual actions. Uh, the morpheme ang is responsible for providing a sense of repetition, but as we've seen, it doesn't affect all verbs similarly. So it seems to me that the nature of the actions. Um, seems to be key here. So if we compare walking and hitting, they're quite different actions. So this has led me to consider the possibility that um, this might have to do yeah, with the nature of the action the verb describes. So if um, the action described, just walking, is already something that's a repeated action, so putting one foot in front of the other, the meaning is not altered. But otherwise, for example, if we say, okay, hitting just is this one beat, then um, it would make sense to say, okay, in this case, it gains this element of repetition because we um, change the way we look at it. Then again, of course, I have to say this would, this depends on the way you look at the action. So if you, if you just consider hitting being one blow, then this would work. But if we say, okay, hitting is several blows of them, this is just the whole, you know, the whole action, then this wouldn't work. So it would depend on your angle. And again, there was one case where this didn't quite work. So um, if we say nilidza, that would say that would mean I eat. Um, but technically, we should also, according to this logic, be able to say nilidzanga, whatever that would uh, mean. But apparently, this is an uncommon form which is not really used. Um, and this might be because, um, as I've been pointed out, um, the verb for to eat is not um, not behave slightly differently than other verbs, so it's slightly irregular. So this might well be a reason. And lastly, I also encountered not many, but a handful of expressions for a du reduplica reduplication, which could then be divided into two opposing categories. So on the one hand, uh, reduplication caused uh, once again an intensified meaning. Um, for example, as another way of expressing very, um, as we can see in this first sentence, ikulu kulu, or again in tai tai, which we also had in the sentence tai tai uloiwa earlier on. So this is really to emphasize the truly or very part in that. Um, however, there was also um, a case where we had the mankisha mankisha, but that didn't mean that we tried to run very, very quickly or something, but quite the opposite. So um, if we take an entire verb form and reduplicate that, um, yeah, like I said, opposite happens, exactly. Um, so consequently, this suggests, I would say, that if only either the adjective or which is more likely, and this was also suggested again by my peer, Stephen, that simply the root of the verb or the word um, undergoes this morphological process. The meaning is actually augmented, but if more than just the root, is uh, reduplicated, the meaning is diminished. Um, so then I'll come to my conclusion. So my findings have demonstrated 
basically only the tip of the iceberg that is a variation of verbal expressions in this language. And I've certainly not captured many further alternative, uh, alternatives that exist. Um, and as expected, there are usually no direct translations. And reduplication operates um, quite differently, um, very much dependent on the word or yeah, the, the word you're looking at or the part of the word that's reduplicated. So ultimately, the conclusions I've drawn just reflect the results based on a very limited amount of data. Um, and much more research is obviously required in order to corroborate any of these findings or expand upon them. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much, Jennifer Songela Nwewe. Um I I have to say I I think one of one of the highlights in in the many of uh, of this particular course was was probably the second last day of elicitation when um Jenny you were eliciting I'm not sure if it was if it was uh like he 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 barely or he doesn't and Nico gave us these new uh verb forms so we had we had the word kumanka is to run but then to to barely run is kimang kisa, and then to run very quickly or to run well is kumang kesha, um, yeah. and I have to say that was that was a real uh, that was a real uh, exciting moment. And then when he volunteered these other verbs, these other lexical verbs with the same morphology, um, uh, it makes me think about how you know you kind of set about looking at adverbials and ended up having to engage very much with the verbal morphology of the language. A lot of what maybe we might have said is adverbial seems to fall very much inside of the inside of the 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 the, the verb in Ihanzu. Do you have any thoughts or would you like to respond to that? Um actually it was also I'm not sure whether I would say I was surprised because I didn't know what to expect. Um, but was, I think now reflecting on that, I was more surprised to find that there are actually some of the, um, for example, if we look at sometimes that this is expressed the way it is. So um, very simply by combining one and time, for example, but then again, you have um, yeah, similar expressions like um, yeah, frequency, which can be expressed in so many different ways. And um, that's probably also very much dependent on on the speaker and their yeah and, and then the the moment they're speaking in I suppose which ones they would then use and probably the larger context in which the uh, the phrase yeah. occurs I mean obviously one of the weaknesses of working in the way that we worked is sort of the maximum chunk that we were dealing with was the phrase. And so when Nico received a phrase, and this isn't a commentary just uh, on your particular sessions, this is a commentary on the whole sort of classic elicitation method, right? When we're just saying the boy always walks, uh, there's probably several different things in there that several different ways that you could that you could uh, interpret that. Uh, so uh, Nico was probably giving us one or two of that, and it would be interesting to see, okay, well, if we had this in a narrative and if there was a lot of other sort of context built up around it, would we get this form? Would we get another form? Um, also, what we don't really know is, for example, whether some of the forms Nico gave me um, were perhaps just specific to, I'm not sure whether, how how many regional differences there are, maybe specific to the variety of Hansu which he speaks. Yes, um, I haven't encountered huge, uh, huge, like, uh, dialectal difference. But again, I mean, you know, like, the, we, we, we haven't, you know, done a tremendous amount of work on the language. So, you know, that could very well be, uh, be an element as well. Uh, I should say, um, if anybody does have any questions at this point, do feel free to um, use the raised hand uh, uh, reaction in the uh, uh, reactions button at the bottom of the module. Or uh, if you have any questions that you might want to uh, write out, you can write them out in the chat module and I'll read them out. Um, Jenny, uh, before we move on to Lutz's question, um, 
do you have any thoughts of what would be a priority for your for if if you had to do another elicitation session or if you wanted to move this further in some way if you wanted to sort of go further in depth or move your research forward do you have any sort of priorities for what sort of data you would like i think i would first of all focus on the last few, few slides so basically my hypothesis on um the morphemes of ang and l and also the reduplication because this is where i had the least data because i only thought of that quite late and so i would like to kind of find out more about that because it seems to be quite a yeah a deep topic um no. deep and just incredibly broad um i mean there's just yeah. there's so much stuff there um Lutz, you have your hand up feel free to unmute yourself uh thank 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 you thank you very much jenny for the presentation really really fascinating as well and I think you know what you what you just said with the last slides, what you, you know, what you brought out with the ang and the l, I think it was really interesting, both on their own and and in combination. And of course, comparatively, they look very much like like the habitual or repetitive or you know continuous ag ang. Um, and the l, of course, looks very much like an applicative from the morphology and indeed party from the semantics. It's a really interesting area. Um, but um, but the other thing I wanted to ask is about the I think it's attenuative. Um, yes. This, this suffix. And also, actually, that links also, Stephen, I didn't ask in your talk because because the discussion then very, very, very much also, I thought it was interesting to listen to. But I was interested that that seems to be the only suffix which which doesn't undergo the harmony, which, which is interesting because most other, you know, extension derivation suffixes, I think are reconstructed with the lower vowels so that they harmonize. And then I was wondering, is it a derivational suffix? Is it, is it, is it a more inflectional one? Of course, it's also difficult to draw that distinction. So Ang sits exactly in the same same space, I think. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, if you can say more about what you found with the is, um, Jenny, and with these examples, I thought they were really interesting. Um, I'm afraid I didn't find much more on them than I've got on the slides and that, that I told you about. Um, so this is something else one would have to look at um, how to what extent what could one, one could use them, for example, um, and in which context they would work then, which they wouldn't. But maybe Stephen has something to say on that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so I, I really, yeah, have Jenny to thank, though, for the, the, the data that I gathered on uh, the, yeah, what I call the attenuative and the, the intensive suffixes, because, um, yeah, we kind of just stumbled across those, and then I was... I had to change all of my plans in my elicitation for that session, um, which is fantastic. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so I I, cause I elicited quite a few forms because I was trying to obviously get them after as many vowels as possible. And yeah, the I mean, the reason I, it's funny because we ended, I think we independently chose a label attenuative for this, um, which I think is su sufficiently vague to encompass all of the different uses that I was able to find and seemingly Jenny was able to find in her data as well. Um, so it, it could kind of range from doing something slowly to doing something poorly or not doing something enough. So we had an example. Um, so yeah, we have walking slowly. We had an example that I was given. And, you know, there was various shades of meaning could co-occur depending on yeah, I think as Jenny says, maybe the semantics of the verb, and also as Andrew mentioned, the 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 context in which the verb is used. Um, and so, yeah, I had one example which was say, if you use the east with cook, it was the primary. Well, the the meaning that Nico immediately gave us was, you've got say five people over for dinner, but you only cook cook food for three people, right? Um, or it could mean you're cooking slowly. And he didn't, I don't think, to the best of my recollection, he gave us, it could mean you're cooking badly, but I imagine you could probably concoct some sort of scenario where it might mean you're cooking badly. Um, yeah, they're just, yeah, it was very, very broad. Um, and it's really interesting, would be really interesting to, to, yeah, like say, explore some of these avenues that Jenny pointed out, looking at semantics and so on. As to the historical origin of this, um it so i know that the causative is sometimes reconstructed with a degree one vowel as opposed to a degree two vowel but it's not immediately obvious to me why if you know why it would then transform into this intensive meaning plus i don't think in terms of sound correspondences 
it really works. Because um, I think you would probably, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, but I think probably you would expect an H in like long in the in any surviving um, descendants of the long causative form. Um, this is uh, this is still up uh, up in the air, and I think Stanislav would uh, would agree here. Is like what historically turns to H in Ihanzu uh, from S. I, I mean, we know that this is that this is a, a sound change that it seems like it's relatively frequent, but you can still see a lot of S's in Ihanzu. You know. Uh, obviously, very iconically, you can see it in in in, in the name of of the language. People from uh, other groups nearby will call the language Isanzu, and then it's called Ihanzu. Ihanzu speakers themselves. That's a whole other topic that needs to be looked at. But I I think that I think that you're right. Yeah, where do we what? Why do we get this form? Uh, this is um, it 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 does really stick out when when you look at when you look at the the other morphology of the language. I mean, I suppose there is the potential it could be some sort of verb which has been swallowed up into the the verb complex, right? But yeah, that's to the that's an interesting idea. idea. We've talked about that um, happening in other parts of the uh, of the verb for languages like Ihanzu or languages in the wider area. Very neat. Um, uh, do uh, we have any further questions for Jenny or Jenny? Do you have anything that you'd like to add to what we've just mentioned? Um, not from my side, no. Yeah, I should say again that um, just three cheers for for dealing with uh, data that has come in so many different uh, shapes and forms. I mean, you're working with verbal morphology, you're working with uh, with adverbials, things that look like adverbials. You're looking you're looking at things that have have duplicated and and might come from other words. Um, I, I think it. I think it's really admirable how you sat down and sort of, you know, tried to tried to make sense of everything that you were getting. Some of the elicitation sessions, I remember thinking, "Oh my gosh!" Like there's just so many different forms here to deal with. Um, so three cheers for uh, for uh, for sort of taking it all on board and saying something so interesting. Uh, really uh, appreciate it.